Bonjour à tous et bienvenue à la troisième édition du Forum Galia Afrique, plateforme qui récompense et reconnaît l'innovation sur le continent africain. Pour commencer cette session, je donne la parole tout de suite au docteur Moredrek Chibi, qui est a, a Program Officer à l'OMS Afrique, le bureau régional de l'Organisation mondiale de la santé basée à Brazzaville. Dr. Moredrek Chibi, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, good afternoon. Good evening to you all. Uh, welcome to this special event to launch the Africa Young Innovators for Health Award 2021. This initiative is timely for our continent in a number of ways. Think about Africa harnessing its demographic dividend we are basically referring to the potential of young people to unleash their ingenuity and creativity to come up with innovative products and services to accelerate improvements in the well being of our people. <clears throat> Again, I often hear young people saying, whatever is done for us without us is against us. Now, this is one of the initiatives that young people can be actively involved in shaping the future of health delivery on the continent, inclusive of your needs and desires. In the context or in the current context that we are in, we have seen lots of innovations that are currently being deployed for COVID-19 and they've been predominantly developed by young people. As WHO, we were so proud to note that about 13% of the global technological innovations for COVID-19 actually emerged from our continent. This has helped our countries, including our frontline workers in the response to COVID-19. Numerous of these innovations were ICT driven, for instance, self-assessment applications embedded with an alert system that have been rolled out in most of our countries. And this has limited inflow of patients in already overburdened health facilities. Take for instance, in Rwanda, we saw robots being deployed to screen patients for COVID-19. And this has contributed significantly in reducing infections among our precious health care workers. What it simply means is the world is looking out for innovative solutions from our young people, not only for COVID-19, but to reimagine the future of health systems that is adaptive, resilient, and most importantly, human-centered. So to our young people here, I wish to encourage you to take this initiative seriously, not because of the attractiveness of the price tag for the winners, but to contribute to the betterment of our people on the continent. For it is through young people that the future of Africa lies. I thank you. Over to you, Christi uh, Catherine. Thank you, Doctor. Merci beaucoup, Doctor, uh, pour ces mots uh, d'introduction. Thank you, Doctor, for these. Uh for this introduction. It is true that uh, this year, the Gallian Forum, which is the third edition, will concentrate mainly on youth and uh, women leaders. And it is in this prospect that we are launching the award of young innovators. This uh, initiative shows the will of uh, two organizations, uh, Speak Up Africa and IFPMA, uh, to identify young innovators in the field of health. That uh, we can develop. Um, I think we have a small problem here. Um, je, je, je continue, I, I just go ahead, je continue en français. 
je disais que cette initiative euh, qui, qui marque en fait la, la volonté de Speak Up Africa et de IFPME de repérer, d'identifier les, les, les pépites de la jeunesse africaine euh, qui sont remplies d'idées et qui sont particulièrement innovateurs dans le domaine de la santé. Alors, comme vient de le souligner le docteur Moredrek Chibi, il est vrai que dans cette pandémie, durant ce contexte pandémique du COVID, de la COVID-19, l'Organisation mondiale de la santé peut faire appel à des innovations, tout comme les pays qui ont décidé de mettre beaucoup plus d'énergie à mettre, à faire confiance en leur jeunesse pour mettre en application des idées innovatrices, par exemple, pour tracer les, les personnes qui sont atteintes de la COVID-19 et, et pour permettre de mieux voir l'évolution du virus durant cette pandémie. Mais cette initiative est aussi là pour stimuler l'esprit euh, d'entrepreneuriat euh, avec donc ces solutions innovatrices et pour euh, permettre à des solutions innovatrices de voir le jour, il faut d'une part un soutien financier euh, qui pourra être euh, pourvu euh, à ces personnes, un mentoring, c'est-à-dire des personnes qui permettront, qui seront là pour encadrer les jeunes innovateurs, mais également pour mettre en place euh, tout le système nécessaire pour protéger la propriété intellectuelle euh, justement de ces idées innovatrices. Alors aujourd'hui, nous avons le, la chance d'avoir un, pa un panel absolument euh, extraordinaire puisque nous avons entre autres Temi Giwa Tubonson qui est CEO de LifeBank. Alors Temi est, est quelqu'un euh, qu'il qui ne faut plus présenter puisqu'elle a gagné de nombreux prix, euh, que ce soit de manière euh, internationale euh, ou, ou locale, elle a eu cette idée absolument incroyable euh, de Life Bank. Elle va nous expliquer plus tard euh, comment cette idée euh, est arrivée à son esprit et comment elle a souhaité euh, la mettre en application sur le continent africain. Nous avons également la chance euh, d'avoir euh, Cynthia Genolet, euh, qui est la chef euh, des systèmes de santé et de la politique africaine à IFPME, basée à Genève. Et nous avons Maël Ba, qui est manager de communication stratégique à Speak Up Africa. Et je garde, je dirais le meilleur pour la fin, nous avons l'immense honneur d'avoir Madame la ministre d'État, Awa Marie Kolsek, qui est avec nous et qui pourra nous permettre de, de procéder à des conclusions à la fin des échanges puisque madame la ministre d'état a une grande expérience et a toujours été quelqu'un qui encourageait les populations jeunes et les idées innovatrices tout au cours de sa brillante carrière alors je vais tout de suite donner maintenant I'm going to turn to Temi Temi, uh, you're with us today Um, okay, I, the time that you unmute Temi, I will just remind the, the attendees, je vais juste rappeler aux participants qu'ils ont la possibilité de poser leurs questions à la fois par, uh, uh, à travers la petite icône Q and R, donc Q et R, qui signifie questions et réponses, qui est située en bas de votre écran. Euh, vous avez également, lorsque vous euh, cliquez sur l'icône « Participant euh, », vous devez normalement voir apparaître une possibilité de lever la main si vous souhaitez obtenir la parole. Et euh, je vous demanderai aimablement de bien veiller à ce que vos noms, prénoms et qualités ou entités à laquelle vous appartenez soient bien indiqués pour que l'on puisse vous identifier euh, lorsque la parole vous sera éventuellement donnée au cas où vous auriez des, des questions précises à poser. Mais sinon, vous avez cette icône euh, qui est euh, indiquée dans, dans laquelle vous pouvez poster vos questions et les partager avec l'ensemble des participants. 
If you, you can, have questions, uh, then you can share them with all the participants. Now I will give the floor to Timmy. Now I'll turn towards uh, Timmy. Timmy, are you back? Sorry, okay, I have my dear. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It is a pleasure and honor to have you on the show today. Uh, not only because you're a woman. Uh, so, I mean, this is already great news uh, to have young, beautiful, brilliant uh, women uh, that uh, are um, getting awards. Uh, but it is also a way as a, a, a person uh, that found um, a brilliant ID and decided to implement that ID to give, to give, in fact, birth to that ID on the African continent. Because uh, could you, in two or three points, just tell us where you come from, how it happened that you decided to, to have um, this ID, and why you decided to, in fact, give life, give birth to that, uh, uh, that baby uh, in Africa? Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you, uh, IFPMA and Speak of Africa. I am incredibly honored that you gave me a chance to be here today. Apologies, I only speak English. Uh, I could, no, no, that's okay. I, I, uh, all right, I hope everyone is, uh, is able to understand what I'm saying. Um, uh, first, Professor uh, Kosek, it's such an honor to be on this panel with you today. Um, you know, I started Life Bank because, you know, I found a, a, a problem that I couldn't stop thinking about. Um, it was basically postpartum hemorrhage is the highest cause of maternal death in the world. Um, basically, a mom gives birth within uh, about 30 minutes and four hours, she's dead. So it's a, she starts bleeding and then that leads to death. So it's a big problem across Africa. Um, you, you know, I, I felt duty bound after having a boy myself. I had my son seven years ago um, and it was his birth that really got me thinking seriously about maternal health. Um, I was very lucky to be living in the US at the time. I was very lucky to have access to healthcare, to have access to the best doctors, to all the resources that I needed. Um, and I knew women in Africa do not have the same access. So I moved back to Africa, Nigeria specifically, and launched this organization that ensures blood, you know, is available in the hospital as soon as a woman gives birth. So thank you, uh, Temi, to, to explain us the beginning of this uh, wonderful adventure. Uh, but how did you, in fact, uh, how was it possible to, to really put it from, I would say, go from scratch and from that ID that you said, okay, this is something that is obviously missing in Africa. How did you, what was the, first, the next step? Because as we know, what happens often is that people have uh, 100 IDs, but when it comes mm. to, I mean, transfer it into reality, the first thing people say, you need money. And when you're young, and uh, most of the time when you're a young woman, uh, it is even more uh, difficult to find a financement. So how did you manage that? To whom did you turn to? Or have you been lucky? <laughs> uh, of course, I was very young. Uh, I had no money. I had a little boy that was about eight months at the time. Um, it was also, you know, I, I had a lot of responsibility to my family. So I, and I also actually had a job, uh, but I couldn't stop thinking about this idea. I, you know, I wake up in the morning, I'll think about it. I'll go to bed at night, I'll think about it. So the idea really captured my attention. Um, and it was you know, a very idea that we could build a distribution system that helps uh, deliver these critical resources to the place that it's needed. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. All right. Um, so exactly. So it was this idea that that um, that captured my attention. So I knew automatically that I needed an institution that would help me uh, in developing the idea. 
in fundraising, in you know, giving training, in ensuring that we had all the resources and all the knowledge we really need to make this idea come alive. So I went around. First, I needed to prove the concept. So I put some savings, you know, some of my you know, uh, you know, salary into building out the platform. And then I took that platform to these institutions. We call them um, in this in, in this part of the world, we call them uh, uh, tech hubs. Uh, so I went you know, to these tech hubs and I told them my idea and what I wanted to do. And they were all keen on it. Um, and I was very lucky to get the first person to back me and say, here is cash, here is education, here is knowledge, here is training, uh, go start this idea. And the institution is called Co-Creation Hub. Okay, and so from, from the beginning on, you had that wonderful support, in fact, that uh, helped you go ahead. Yes, absolutely. You know, when you have a new idea, you need training. At the time, I had not had a ton of experience in, in business. I had a lot of experience in healthcare. You know, I had domain expertise in healthcare, but I didn't understand how to run a business. I had not worked in a business before. Um, I didn't understand how to run a tech company. Uh, so I really felt like I needed to be trained, uh, but also I knew that I needed access to capital. And they were offering both and I was very lucky to, but before then I had to first build the idea. I had to first invest in the idea. It's called skin in the game. So as a young person, if you really believe in your idea, take whatever little resource you have Either a human resource, like if you have friends who are techies who can help you build it. Uh, if you have, you know, family members who understand, maybe they have a little bit of money that I can give you to start it. If you have a job yourself and you have resources, make sure that you invest in the idea so that people believe that they see how much you believe in it. Because when someone says, I'm going to quit my job, you know, even though I have an eight month old baby, and when someone says I'll quit my job to work on this idea, when they say that I'll put my last salary in growing this idea, when people see that they're happy and they want to back you because they believe that you have that passion. Yeah, so in fact, you have to first believe in yourself in order to make the other trust you. Because I mean, you have to be totally involved uh, and dedicated to your own ID uh, in order to, to attract the others to do the same, which is, which Absolutely. is yeah, which is not always easy. Um, I, I, no. I, I, sorry, uh, Temi, I will just say a few words in French, if you allow me. Um, je voudrais juste rappeler uh, aux participants que la petite icône Q et R, qui est indiquée en bas de l'écran, peut recevoir vos questions. Si vous avez des questions à adresser à Temi, s'il vous plaît, utilisez euh, cet euh, outil pour poser des questions. Euh, merci beaucoup. Um, Temi, no, I was just referring to the audience to say that they could uh, use the Q&R, uh, um, you know, tool in order to ask you questions. So everything started with blood and that live bank. So, of course, through the years, you did... Um, in fact, um, develop the ID and um, decided to go in other um, domains where you felt that there was a, a need and maybe an, an open gap that could be filled. So could you please explain us how you did? And also, when you started with blood, blood is, is something very important, uh, very rare. Um, so how did you manage, even if you had a very big experience in the health domain, uh, how did you manage to uh, find the, the confidence of the government, of authorities, because everybody is not allowed to um, work with blood? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I, in the beginning, that's a great question. I didn't want to... You know, the problem that we saw was not a problem. It wasn't a lab problem. You know, it wasn't specifically science problem. It wasn't the science of blood. What the problem we wanted to solve was distribution. So it is supply chain, moving products from point A to point B to point C. That was the problem. That was, that was the issue that, that was a cause of uh, maternal death. In the world um it was it wasn't because there's no blood in the market it was who is going to move this blood quickly to the hospital where the woman is delivering a baby uh so we knew that it was a distribution problem 
And to be honest, governments and labs and science people and healthcare people were not comfortable building this kind of business because it's really, it's not in their expertise. And it's not, you know, you need someone who's focused on supply chain. And because I had an expertise in supply chain for healthcare, okay. I was able to sort of like build out this business um, and the government was happy for me to do it. Um, you know, of course, you know, COVID-19, I think it was, a has been a terrible event in the world, but I think it has some silver lining. For us at LifeBank, the silver lining is it forced us to expand our business model. You know, we had been fully blood focused for many, many, many years, um, but you know, people needed medical oxygen. You know, they needed testing kits. They needed the right equipment across the region, across in Kenya, where we now operate in Nigeria. Um, people really needed help. That wasn't just, of course, they still needed blood, but they needed oxygen as well. And there was a desperation there that we felt we could solve. Uh, so we started working. We, we used the exact same system the exact same distribution system to build a value chain around medical oxygen, around COVID-19 test kits, you know, around making sure that ventilators, respirators were available across these two countries where we operate. And I think that was incredibly useful. We've been able to be innovative and expand our, our product um, and the value that we bring to the market significantly. So my, my next question is, is related to the fact about time. How many years did you get to put your business together into blood distribution and i suppose that when um the virus uh, covid 19 virus uh, uh occurred i mean the pandemic uh in march suddenly the government and maybe authorities and everyone turned to you because you had already that very uh good trustable um, um, I mean, um, chain, in fact, in the distribution of blood, then they turn to you for um, PPEs, uh, test kits, and oxygen. Uh, did it work like that? And also, could you please give us a little bit more details about how you did expand in neighboring countries? Because um, working in one country is one thing, because, mm. of course, I suppose that um, because you're very energetic and... Uh, uh, apparently nothing resists you. Uh, it's quite easy to do it in the place where you live. But what about um, other governments, other countries? And um, uh, did you only, are you only focusing on English speaking countries or are, uh, do you have any uh, projects with French speaking countries? Um, tell us uh, all about it. Yes, a lot of questions. Let me yeah. try to answer them. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much. Those are really important questions. Uh, I think that we were a blood business, a fully blood distribution business for four years. This was four years in one country for one product, basically building our business, building that supply chain, building our capacity to distribute these products in the right condition and very rapidly. Uh, we expanded across Nigeria in all the regions in Nigeria. Nigeria is a very large country. So already it feels like we're operating in multiple countries. And Nigeria is also a country that uh, all these different regions are not very similar. They don't have language, they don't have the same culture. The governments, the local governments are really, really important. The, the federal system is not you know, it's not as strong, local business, local systems, local governments are really powerful. So we already sort of had a sense we're operating in multiple countries. I mean, Northern Nigeria is very, very different from Southern Nigeria. So uh, of course, when you can operate in those two markets, it trains you how to operate in a brand new country. Uh, so, but COVID-19 hit, and like you said, we had built a reputation um, and expertise in distributing these critical resources uh, around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the safe, uh, in, in a very safe WHO approved uh, blood system. Um, and, you know, we just, we, you know, we were asked, you know, we rose to the occasion, we opened a testing center for COVID-19, we expanded our distribution system for medical oxygen, um, and we were able to do that. When we expanded, we were looking to expand outside Nigeria. Kenya is very, uh, is an amazing country, but it is also quite famous for the problem around the blood system. And that was what 
drew us to that country. Of course, it's much easier when you operate in a country that's also English speaking, but that doesn't mean that we want to be only in places that are English speaking. We are absolutely interested in expanding to you know, French speaking world. Uh, why? Because we think the problem exists there as well. And we think that there is a value we can add there. Um, of course, you know, what really matters when you're expanding outside the market where you first launched is getting the right team, is getting the people. That's it's not Amy that's going to do the work in Senegal or, or Cote d'Ivoire or any of these places. It is the local folks that will do the work. My job is to make sure that I invest and I train and I coach, and then they are able to deliver these resources in these markets. Uh, so definitely be on the lookout. We are looking to expand to to Francophone, uh, you know, Africa. We we want to, you know, we want to. We are already working on translating all our you know, you know uh, uh, tech and our platforms and our SOPs into the French language so that we can expand to this part of the world. We think there's a lot of value we can add and we're really keen to come and add that value. So in fact, you have to be a, a very great conductor and, and you have like, uh, yeah, uh, and the others are each playing the instrument. But and one of the questions we, we, we have through the, the chat is, how do you make money out of blood? I mean, mm. we know that in, uh, in Africa, particularly, um, it is very difficult for hospitals, for entities to find the money, even to buy um, normal medicine, you know? So how, who is paying you? How are you sure that the people you're working for are going to pay you? Or did you work at the beginning in having, in asking, uh, and a payment in advance, how did you manage it? Because we know that so much, so many people try even in other businesses that are not so difficult um, to, to be paid. And um, it's often the same story. They deliver, but they're not paid. So how did you organize it from the beginning and how are you making money from it today? Yes, so in the beginning, we've always been a business. We believe in the power of business to build sustainability uh, uh, into, uh, into your work. We think that if you don't have a business model, uh, if you opt for a grant model and you don't have a business model as an innovator, that it will be really hard to sustain your work over time because grants run out, you know, but if you're adding value and people are willing to pay for your services, customers will not run out. They will always come. Uh, we don't make money from blood. We are not, uh, like I said, we're not a blood business. We are a distribution business. So the same way DHL makes money, the same way you know, um, you know, any distribution business would make money is how we make money. So we make money by ensuring that we're delivering these critical supplies, and they're not normal supplies. They're not like any medicine that can go into any truck. Uh, these are supplies that have to you have to maintain their cold chain, meaning you have to keep them cold uh, in a certain temperature throughout the entire distribution. Uh, so it's a very highly expert driven work and hospitals who, who are customers understand that and are willing to pay us for our expertise. Uh, so it's basically, we are the DHL for medical supplies, but a DHL that is also very special in terms of, you know, we can maintain temperature, we can maintain, you know, um, you know, we can maintain, you know, the quality, we can maintain, we can maintain, you know, just even keeping the product together and making sure that the bag where the blood comes in does not get, you know, uh, 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 torn, et cetera. So for us, what we, what we really serve, serve is how we serve our market is by distributing these critical resources in the right condition, making sure that we're maintaining the coaching and our hospitals are happy to pay us for that service. So, I mean, when we listen to you, I mean, everything seems very simple. So uh, one of the question uh, in the chat is what were the biggest obstacles uh, you had to face? What was really a problem at the beginning? At the beginning, it was just the amount of capital that was needed. Like I said, it was a very special thing and you need the right equipment. You know, it was just, you know, all the first about 90% of all the investment we got in the first year went into the equipment. So you can see how 
capital intensive and how equipment intensive uh, our work is. Uh, so that was the first. But now that we have, we've proven our model, people have seen us, access to capital is not so difficult. Now what's difficult is actually security. How do I ensure that we keep people safe? Because we're delivering this product around the clock in the morning, early in the morning, late in the night, 2 a.m., 1 a.m. You know, we have riders out there delivering these critical resources. So for us, it's very important to them safe. So what we're now facing now is security of our, of our, of our riders. But in the beginning, it was access to capital. Access to capital, okay. And um, what are you, what is um, is or are your advice your advices for um, the the young um, the young people that have an ID that would like um, to jump into uh, the reality? What would you advise them to do? Let's say that you, you I mean, there are so many people watching you uh, and listening to you. You're really inspiring. And so what would you advise them to do? If you have an idea that you know, keeps you up at night, that makes you feel really excited, uh, that makes you feel like you know, this is what you're meant to do with your life, um, I say you have to go for it. Uh, because like I always say, I would rather not regret something. I would rather regret something I did than regret something I didn't do. Uh, so I think you should start. Um, you know, you're going to face problems, but here's what I have to say to you. You have all it takes to solve those problems. It's actually very, it's in your hand. You have everything you need to solve the problem you're going to face. Why? Because you're young, you're innovative, you cost, uh, and you're going to be, you're going to work hard. You're going to be relentless. Uh, I think it's really important that Africans, young Africans solve African problems. Um, I think that it is really, really absolutely important for us to commit to solving this problem. So I'm rooting for you. Uh, if you have the same issue that I had in the beginning about access to capital, I'm sure many, many, many people have that problem. What I will say to you is um, put skin in the game, do the work. And once you've proven your model, capital will look after you. They, you know, it is the people with the capital that will call you, that will request to meet with you, that will tell you that they have this opportunity. Once your model has been proven and once you're growing and once you put the skin in the game. So last question, what is your advice for the authorities and, and the banks? We, we, we start to see in, in certain countries banks or um, departments that are dedicated to women, uh, so financial support mm -hmm. of, for projects for women. Uh, but I mean, we have mm -hmm. also men around, uh, young men and young women. Um, what would right. be your advice for the authorities um, to support innovation and, and to uh, maybe better inform about intellectual property too? Mm. Mm, absolutely. I, I think you're right. Intellectual property is absolutely crucial. Um, but I also think that access to capital and access to uh, markets are important. Uh, if you have an innovator in healthcare, a significant amount of healthcare services in Africa happens in government hospitals. Uh, so, you, you know, an innovator needs to work with government, needs to partner with government hospitals to be able to deliver their innovation and get it to scale. So for me, my belief is that it's really, really critical to have African government supporting African innovators. Uh, so my suggestion is look into your markets, look into your country, look to country, companies like LifeBank, invite young people to solve critical problems, entrench problems, in your communities. It is the way, you know, we, you know, young people of this year, of this age are incredibly innovative. They are focused, they have great ideas. What they need is access to markets, access to capital and access to resources. Uh, and by being a government and banks too, so not just governments, banks, institutions in countries, it's really important to support our young people because they are innovative they are creative and they can bring important solutions to entrench problems in our communities. Demi, a big, big, big thank you and a big applause for everything you did until now, but good luck for the 
the, the rest. I mean, um, plenty of uh, the young people that are watching us and watching you are really wanting to follow your steps. You mm -hmm. are really inspiring. And thank you again for being with us. It has been so interesting and inspiring. So thank you so much, dear. Thank you so much, Catherine, for having me. Um, have a lovely rest of this session. Thank you so much. Merci, Temi, pour, pour cette... Uh, thank you, Temi, for this uh, testimony, exceptional testimony that inspires many. I would like to take this uh, opportunity before we show you a video on the uh, health workers to uh, speak up Africa. thank the organizer, Speak Up Africa uh, and today. IFPMA, but also uh, all the uh, media partners that are with us uh, today during this session. The uh, young uh, African in health innovator that is uh, that has the, su the support of Broadridge, Ecobank, Ecobank, Demi, the Gallian Foundation, Intra Health International, Microsoft for Africa. Thank you, thank you again. And the uh, partnership with RNB, with Malaria and Social Change Factory. Thank you to the uh, cdev.net as well. We will now show you a small a short videos on healthcare workers and then following that we will uh, sh start the second part of this third edition of the forum galien africa <laughs> La COVID-19 a montré l'importance de mettre en place des systèmes de santé solides, capables de lutter contre la pandémie, tout en continuant à fournir des services de santé essentiels. Cette crise nous a fait prendre conscience que les professionnels de santé constituent l'épine dorsale de tout système sanitaire. Des communautés tout entières manifestent leur soutien aux travailleurs de santé. Il est urgent qu'ils bénéficient des ressources dont ils ont besoin pour accomplir leur travail dans les meilleures conditions. J'ai choisi ce métier parce que c'est un métier que j'aime. En plus, c'est pour aider les malades. J'ai exercé depuis 10 ans ce métier. Je m'appelle Jela Diouf. Je suis un agent de santé. Je préfère être un agent de santé parce que j'aime ce filière pour aider les populations. Moi, c'est Hassan Dion. Je suis lycée du poste santé de Canaba. Euh, en fait, euh, je suis entré dans la santé parce que c'était une option que j'aimais beaucoup. Alors que le continent africain supporte presque un quart du fardeau mondial des maladies, seulement 3% du personnel de santé mondial travaille en Afrique. Nous devons trouver des solutions innovantes pour relever les défis auxquels les travailleurs de santé sont confrontés. J'ai décidé d'être sage-femme, tout d'abord par passion, pour le métier et ensuite pour aider dans la lutte contre la mortalité maternelle et non natale. Les défis que j'ai rencontrés dans le cadre du travail, je peux citer comme le manque de matériel, le manque de personnel. Oui, l'impact de la COVID-19, euh, c'est quelque chose qui, qui nous a beaucoup touchés. Et vous savez, depuis le 2 mars, la COVID-19 est entrée dans notre pays, euh, notamment au Sénégal. Les structures, beaucoup de structures de santé n'ont pas eu beaucoup de recettes. La pandémie de la COVID-19 a beaucoup impacté les résultats de nos, de nos indicateurs, vu qu'on a remarqué l'existence d'accouchements à domicile. Et aussi, il y a beaucoup de retard par rapport aux consultations prénatales, par rapport à la planification familiale, par rapport à la vaccination et par rapport aux consultations postnatales. Il est temps d'investir dans les travailleurs de la santé pour qu'ils soient mieux équipés, protégés et formés. 
le système de santé au Sénégal, on a besoin de recruter les gens de santé, comme le recrutement des médecins au, niveau, au, au Sénégal, les sages-femmes, de même que des infirmiers, pour augmenter les ressources humaines. On a besoin de, de la création de nouveaux postes de santé, augmenter le plateau technique. Investir dans le personnel de santé, c'est lui fournir les bons outils et technologies. C'est améliorer ses compétences afin de renforcer la qualité des soins et la résilience des systèmes de santé. Nous voilà de retour. So now we are back. Um, we will now move on to the second part of our session that will focus on main, that will mainly focus on the uh, this initiative, this award, this initiative that I think that we have a technical issue. Uh, um, so we'll we'll start. I, I'm I'm sorry. There there seems to be a, a slight uh, problem. So um, alors on va passer. Je pense. Uh, okay. Oh, Est-ce que vous avez la, la seconde Can vidéo? You, do you have the second video? Is the second video ready? I'm not. Um, I don't know if you hear me. Um, could someone from tell me what's going on? Do you hear me? Okay, apparently um, I've been heard, I'm, I'm heard, so um, I was just saying um, that I wanted to go ahead, to go on, and that, um, je parle en français, que cette um, initiative... Uh, that this initiative on which we'll now uh, look, that we will look at now, it is an initiative that uh, shows the uh, uh, will of IFPMA and Speak Up Africa to really uh, give a chance to the youth, the African youth, but also the young innovator of the health sector in Africa to be uh, trained, stimulated, and to be able to follow the uh, lead of Temi, this wonderful Temi with which we've uh, talked, uh, with whom we've exchanged at the beginning of the session. So to do so, first of all, I believe that we need to watch a short video. Can someone uh, please uh, tell me it's working? So we'll now show the second video now. L'année 2020 a été une année sans précédent. En effet, la pandémie de la COVID-19 nous a démontré l'importance d'avoir des systèmes de santé solides et d'investir non seulement dans le capital financier, mais également dans le capital humain, c'est-à-dire les travailleurs de santé qui représentent la pierre angulaire d'un système de santé efficace. Les professionnels de santé prodiguent des services et des soins indispensables, que ce soit au niveau de l'information, mais aussi de la prévention et du traitement des enfants, des femmes et des hommes sur tout notre continent. Dès lors, ils sont notre ressource de santé la plus précieuse, car aucune autre catégorie de travailleurs ne joue un rôle aussi important pour le bien-être des populations, et ce, quel que soit le pays. 
Alors que le continent représente plus d'un quart de la charge de morbidité mondiale, l'Afrique est confrontée à une pénurie de plus de 2 millions de professionnels de santé. Et d'autre part, à l'échelle mondiale, il ne représente que 2% de ses effectifs. Ce manque de ressources humaines met à rude épreuve le travail de ces professionnels, qui luttent pour notre bien-être, mais également sur les systèmes de santé dans leur ensemble. Il est plus que temps que des solutions innovantes soient pensées et développées pour autonomiser et soutenir ces professionnels de santé. Et nous pensons que les jeunes sont plus qu'en mesure de répondre à cette demande. Nous savons que l'Afrique possède le taux d'entrepreneuriat le plus élevé au monde. Et il ne fait aucun doute que la jeunesse africaine réussira à relever les défis sanitaires pressants auxquels notre continent est confronté. AFPME et Speak Up Africa croient en la capacité et le pouvoir des jeunes Africains d'être les acteurs du changement, les innovateurs en Afrique et les leaders d'aujourd'hui et de demain. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous sommes ravis d'annoncer le lancement du prix des jeunes innovateurs africains pour la santé. Conçu pour mettre en lumière et soutenir le travailleur des jeunes pionniers dans le secteur de la santé. Cette année, le prix récompensera des jeunes entrepreneurs africains travaillant activement sur des solutions innovantes pour soutenir les professionnels de santé. Le prix sera décerné à trois jeunes innovateurs capables de prouver que leur solution est ajustable, qu'elle a un impact mesurable sur la santé et une viabilité commerciale. Les trois lauréats recevront un financement pouvant atteindre 40 000 dollars et participeront à un programme de mentorat entrepreneurial de trois mois avec des entrepreneurs africains de premier plan pour les aider à concrétiser leurs projets. Êtes-vous en train de mettre au point une invention innovante dans le domaine de la santé Serez-vous les premiers lauréats du prix des jeunes innovateurs africains pour la santé Merci beaucoup. Voilà. Nous avons euh, eu toutes les informations. Merci beaucoup. Nous avons eu toutes les informations to participate to this prize that is very important um, and quite generous actually. Now I would like uh, quite quickly to uh, give the floor to Gael Ba that we have had the pleasure of uh, listening from in this video. Gael, could you give us uh, some more information, please? Yes, of course, thank you very much. So my name is Mael Ba, actually not Gael. So sorry. No, it's okay. So I am um, the strat uh, com communication strategist as um, Speak Up Africa. So Speak Up Africa is an NGO based in uh, Dakar. And through our program, we try to really favor a uh, policy change to increase uh, a social awareness. How do we do that? By sensitizing, meaning that we create an enabling environment for sustainable development in Africa. We work with all the different sectors in Africa to influence uh, the change in policies. And then what do we do? We uh, support and uh, build on the capacities of our partners in the so civil societies, uh, multilateral organization, and so on and so forth to consolidate their impact and then we uh, we commit uh, we federate these uh, stakeholders to favor action through our organization we uh, work towards uh, the uh, SDGs by focusing for first and foremost on health and working on uh, SDG 1 to 6 that want to improve uh, the transformation of society and make sure that uh, men women and children can live a, a healthy and long life. In Speak Up Africa, we are convinced that it is essential that young people who in, throughout Africa are informed about the uh, global vision for the future because during the nine uh, next year, these young people will uh, live through the results of the SDGs results, but also the main actors of their realization. And as Temi has said it, it is, uh, paramount that young African find the solution for our uh, continent in Speak of Africa. We uh, work in uh, the health sector at the community level with society.
society, civil society organization, but also at the global level. And we understand the importance of innovation and strengthening health uh, structures. We also understand the importance and the uh, crucial role of healthcare workers. And this is why we are very happy to work with IFPMA to uh, launch this award for young innovators uh, in the health sector to promote uh, innovating uh, solution to equip uh, healthcare workers. Speak Thank you very much, Maël Ba from Speak Up Africa. Very dynamic as all the people that are participating today in the third uh, edition of the uh, Gallien Forum Africa. I would like to give the floor to the representative of IFPMA, Cynthia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. I'm very happy to be here with you today. I'll try to uh, be as brief as Maëlle was, uh, first of all, a uh, introduction on IFPMA. We are a, an organization of the biopharmaceutical in industry. We have a consultative status at the uh, United Nations and we have a relationship with the uh, WHO. We represent the pharmaceutical lab, but also regional and national uh, organization association in uh, the world and three in Africa. In IFPMA, we encourage uh, practices that lead to discoveries, to access to drugs and vaccine that improve the well-being of population in the whole world. We also have at the core of our mandate to facilitate collaboration, dialogue and comprehension within our industry, but also with the uh, healthcare workers. The discussion today is focused on innovation, of course, that is essential, central in our activity. Innovation competitivity is at the core of our economic model. Our industry is based on research. We really think uh, uh, we work in collaboration with different actors of the uh, scientific community, as you all know innovation in uh, the uh, health sector leads to uh, a solution in the whole world, the development of new uh, drugs, vaccine, diagnostic uh, devices. This leads to attracting considerable investment, but also uh, capacity building is a priority uh, that can stimulate a, an entrepreneurship future that will meet the local need in innovation, whether it's infrastructure, uh, healthcare workers, uh, new ideas, technologies. So it is an opportunity to increase local capacities and to uh, deal with uh, health issues. So we want to create autonomy that will have an impact on health and development. So this is why we are very happy to launch this award with Speak Up Africa, as we uh, believe that it is paramount to help the new generation of innovators and EFPMA and IFPMA and Speak Up Africa are very happy to be able to stimulate the innovators uh, spirit. We believe that it is uh, crucial to develop local talents so that we can uh, find solutions for the uh, a health sector to transport, transform their uh, creativity in economic uh, strength. So, of course, this uh, goes hand in hand with uh, economic development and uh, promoting innovation on the African uh, on the African continent means that we develop productivity, stimulate uh, commercial trade, and so on and so forth. And this is why, uh, with our work with Speak Up Africa, we are very happy to launch that uh, award. We hope that many young uh, leaders will submit their application. This uh, award uh, re uh, unites the the power of uh, young African and innovation. Thank you very much, Cynthia, that uh, represents IFPMA, one of the uh, organizer of this um, uh, award. Uh, I would like to say that uh, to the participant that if they want to apply for this award, it will be open on the 11th of January, and the deadline is the 31st of March winner will be announced uh, uh, around June, July 2021. 
and dementoring program will start between August and October of 2021. I will now give the floor to Her Excellency. I'll now give the floor the now to Her Excellency, the Minister of State, first of all, Marie Awa. And she has given us the honor to be here. She has graced the forum with her presence, Forum Gala Africa. Madam Minister of State has a world of experience, dynamic experience, and she has always been open to new ideas, and she has always been present for the young. Uh, Madam Minister of State, Professor, you have the floor. Thank you very much. We've had an enriching experience, uh, enriching meeting, and we have facing time constraints. First of all, what I've heard, I've said is unbelievably enriching and encouraging. I would, however, like to take a minute to congratulate, especially Temi, this young entrepreneur who created LifeBank to provide medical equipment for hospitals by using technology and a distribution platform which is multimodal. I must say that uh, what we have heard today has even given us ideas because it gives us the, there's a possibility of extending this to Francophone countries as she said, and uh, this is also very important. And uh, I think we may even be able to talk about this later. Let me also say that there is a problem with the network. You have a fabulous idea to come up with this prize for uh, young innovators. What I would want to say is that uh, we have followed this, we'll make a lot of publicity to ensure that we have as many candidates as possible. Lastly, this prize, as uh, we have seen, is a prize of Speak Up Africa and uh, UF uh, PMA. And this partnership is also very promising. I would like to say a word to Speak Up Africa, which I know and uh, this uh, NGO with which I've uh, very much worked. And I would indeed like to congratulate Madam Yasin Jibu for her leadership, but also for all the community strategies which, which Mael talked about. Mael, who indeed explained very well what this uh, uh, organization was doing on the ground and the constant advocacy. I would like to encourage him and tell him that uh, it is indeed a pride for the continent of Africa. Thank you. Of course, a word for my friend, I almost uh, forget, we have always worked together in Geneva, we've worked a lot, so I'm very happy to have seen you once again. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Minister. Madam Minister of State for this uh, encouraging words. And uh, for this uh, project, which uh, we do not doubt the fact that it will be developed along the corridors at the background, because uh, Temi has not only inspired Her Excellency, Madam Minister of State, but has also inspired many other people who participated at this event. So I do not only hope to thank all the participants, but let me thank the organizers, Speak Up Africa, FPMA, and let me also recall that on the 11th of January, don't forget to submit your candidatures online on the uh, website uh, LD Awards, so that uh, you'll have the opportunity to win. And this will end on the 31st of March, 2021. The results will be announced in the months of June and July next year. I also wanted to avail myself of this opportunity to thank the several sponsors 
who supported this session. I'm referring to Africa.com, Broadridge, Ecobank Academy, Forum Gallia Africa, Microsoft Africa, RBN Partnership, Rollback Malaria Partnership, and would also like to thank Social Change Factory. So I would like to thank all the sponsors, and I would also like to thank Dr. Maury Drake Shibi of the WHO, WHO Africa, based in Brazzaville. And I'd like to thank you all for the testimonies, dynamic testimonies you have made, which has inspired several persons. Thank you all. Thank you, Mael Ba of Speak Up Africa. Thank you, Cynthia Ginole of IFPMA. And uh, thanks to the interpreters and to all the technicians who have worked at the background to make this session possible in two languages and online. So thank you all, and it is time to leave you. I wish you a successful continuation and try to be inspired by this testimony and hope to see you soon. Bye.